a it's it's not a complicated feeling. It's it's a feeling of of tremendous grief, and um, a feeling of um, extreme vulnerability. We're no longer safe uh, in our uh, criticism and commentary. Um, where it used to feel as though it was uh, a a kind of um, detached uh, observational perch that we'd be at. Now, I think we all feel in the middle of events and that what you say can have consequences and there are things at stake and there's a certain amount of risk. And, uh, and I think implicit in the whole thing is the, the question of are we really at the beginning of something that this is just an example of? Are we at the beginning of a time when um, anybody, anywhere, can be rubbed out for an idea? And so the, the only response is more expression. And, our, and my, my big concern is the shutting down. Because in this country, there was a huge wave of self-censorship that came after 9-11. Nobody, almost nobody in the United States could discuss 9-11 in the context of why. Why did it happen? And uh, our president at the time uh, pronounced the, the official reason for it happening as being uh, that they hate us for our freedom. And, uh, and that was sort of the end of the debate for a while, except for Chalmers Johnson and few people talked about blowback, uh, that we have an involvement in the Middle East. Does anybody care how deep that involvement is and, and what it was and what we did there and what we continue to do there and what the, the United States role was in that? Uh, no, that, that didn't happen. People were fired uh, for trying to bring such things up and opposing the war in, in, on Iraq, which uh, now we all agree was fraudulent and based on lies. That's documented. There's no longer cause for debate on that. Uh, but the self-censorship kept that information from flowing. And the information that flowed was, was wrong. Dick Cheney was a big purveyor of false information about all of that. So what we in media noticed at that time there was a great seizing up of expression and uh, uh, paralysis and uh, and I think that this um, creates an environment for more of that for more paralysis so my feeling is to say as much as possible no fight that fight the right wing that will enjoy this I know I did a, an illustration I think I sent that to you of uh, the blood of the Charlie Hebdo massacre feeding the tree of extreme right-wing politics. Um, and that's my big fear, is the paralysis that I saw here in 2001, 2002, 2003, that stopped us from thinking, it stopped us from functioning intellectually in a successful, coherent way. and. Uh, and that this will take place in liberal democracies all over the world. This censorship uh, comes from fear. Um, news is a business in this country especially. There's a lot of money changing hands because of news. People consume news for entertainment purposes mostly, I think. And, the, and, and that leads to an, a misunderstanding of what news is. To me, news is what's happening to somebody else that is going to happen to you next. <clears throat> if it affects you down the road, it's news. If it's a, something about Kim Kardashian or uh, Miley Cyrus, it's not affecting you. And that's not news. It's entertainment. So there's a blending of that and a confusion of that. And uh, as a result, uh, people don't want anything that's going to upset the apple cart, make somebody cancel a, a subscription, make somebody not want to watch, 
uh, make somebody nervous. Or even the advertisers? Advertisers. Uh, advertisers and consumers. There are a lot of consumers who don't want to be made upset by the news. This is an important thing. People watching the news on television want to go to bed feeling good. Or people in the morning when they get up watching the news, they're eating their breakfast. They don't want to spit up their oatmeal because they're seeing a dead body or there's something that's going to be told to them that's deeply upsetting to them. Like right. climate change is coming and your children will not have an economy or an environment to live in uh, in any kind of decent, respectful, civilized way. So everything is couched, everything is hidden, everything is shrouded in a, a comfortable um, veneer. So then that, I think that's where American censorship comes from. There's a commercial straitjacket here. Um, and uh, it's a terrible thing. Um, pollsters have a, a word for um, people who vote without knowing what the hell they're voting uh, about. And, and they use the term low information voter. That's a very <laughs> euphemistic way of talking about people who are ignorant but still going to the polls and voting anyway. Um, are they addicted to voting? <laughs> no, they are They are voting usually in a presidential election because it's a big event. It's it's like the World Series or, or, or Super Bowl or the Oscars. Everybody's in. They're all enjoying us. It's a pageant. It's a pageant. Right. Okay? Um, it's, and so they'll go, to the, they'll go to the polls and not vote about an issue. They won't see a connection between what a, what a candidate says and what he or she uh, is about, right. right? They won't ask, well, who's, what's this person about? Who's supporting him? Who's, who's funding him? They'll say, oh, he looks like a nice guy. I like, I like his smile. I'll have a beer with him, you know? I met George W. Bush. I covered him. He's a lovely man. I, I could, you could have a beer with George W. Bush, and, he, and he's just a, 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 the sweetest guy. The worst president in the history of the United States. Um, so, uh, th this this is what we have to fight against. We have to fight against self censorship. We have to uh, find opportunities, as I do as a freelancer, to find opportunities where I can say real things with pictures and try to get them into this publication and that. So for me, it's 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 largely about. Um, proposing stories and suggesting projects and, uh, and doing books. And, and uh, you hope that there are spots, little places, where um, you can find editors and art directors who are willing to be rude, willing to, to say uncomfortable things. I would like to say yes, but I don't have evidence to back it up. <laughs> I would like to say uh, the people of the United States would embrace uh, satire and ideas in print. Um, we, have, we have our sliver of such people. They subscribe to The Nation, to Mother Jones, they read The New Yorker, they'll watch Daily Show, uh, they'll watch Democracy Now!, they'll read books by Chomsky and Howard Zinn uh, and uh, Barbara Ehrenreich. They're open to having their lives invaded with true and uncomfortable things that can then be made fun of and so that everybody gets the joke. Um, and then honest people like me, that's, that's, we live off of that sliver, right. that, that, that tiny, you know, urban educated slice of America. <clears throat> Uh, people who uh, who will spend money on New York Review of Books. Um, that's that's the group. Of it's people. a minority of the it's whole a small, population. It's a, a very, very small, small chunk. Minority. But it includes most journalists, even right. those journalists who are working for mainstream networks and other publications who are always mitigating how they can take this information they're getting and then kind of uh, uh, process it, you know, pasteurize it for the American people to be given in small increments, sugar-coated, where um, 
we suggest that the country was founded on war and racism and greed, but we don't say it oh, in concentrated ways. Right. We suggest this, uh, and we, we thread it, we marble it into the meat of, uh, of news, which includes, you know, stories about puppies and Kim Kardashian and uh, uh, s Dancing with the Stars. So we hope that in the way it gets marbleized into media, uh, the thrust gets through. Sometimes there are movements in the country where there's so much pain that there's no amount of bullshit that can cover over the truth of it. And that happened during Vietnam. Uh, I'm old enough to remember the 60s and how after a while Vietnam could not be lied about anymore. <clears throat> Similarly with cigarettes. Enough people died of cancer so that the tobacco industry could not produce enough media to cover it over. It just was, the truth was overwhelming because everybody knew someone who was affected by cigarettes. After a while it was just too much, an avalanche of truth. Uh, during Great Depression, avalanche of truth, too much pain, sorry. That's fantastic. I think it's fantastic. Um, when, um, when we talk about cartoons uh, in mass media, it's almost always because we misunderstand what they're about, what, what they're supposed to be doing. Um, we, uh, we had, in this country, Barry Blitz cover for The New Yorker. I don't know if you remember that, but he made fun of the mythology about Obama when he was running for president, so he portrayed him as exactly what the right wing called him, which turned him into a, a radical Muslim, fist bumping with his wife who looked like Angela Davis. It was all this iconography uh, that made fun of the uh, stereotypes that were, were flying around about Obama. A lot of people misunderstood that because they didn't get the joke. Um, a, a, a little, a, a, a bit uh, strange to the idea of irony. Uh, having a regular year, a regular day every year when we collectively discuss, recognize, appreciate caricature, cartoon, satire, uh, strident political commentary, um, thoughtful strident political commentary, is um, going to be an opportunity for us to um, enhance and deepen uh, the understanding of what we do. So I think that, that would contribute to a diminution of the misunderstanding, which is a huge, huge goal, a terrific idea.